Welcome everyone to the Daniels Digital Design Camp Virtual Open House. Today, we hope that your, this session will give you, a, again, a deeper understanding of the programming that we have for this summer and that we can answer all your questions related to the Daniels Digital Design Camp. <clears throat> Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Daniels honours Indigenous people past, present and future here and around the world, and we wish to pay our respect to local elders, including those from, of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you have any questions during the event, please use the Q&A function instead of the chat. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will answer your questions from the Q&A at the end of the event. So I'd like to now welcome our curriculum developer, Nicholas Hoban. Over to you, Nicholas. Hi, Hi everyone. Thank you, Nini, for the introduction. Um, just let me quickly share my screen. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to the Daniels uh, Digital Design Camp uh, 2021 um, outreach. Um, so uh, this, this year uh, will be kind of a continuance of last year in which we uh, presented Daniel's Digital Design Camp in the kind of in a virtual format. Um, it was very successful last year and we'll kind of follow this same regard uh, this year. But firstly, I'd like to you know, take a bit of time to introduce myself. Um, so at the Daniel's faculty, I wear kind of a variety of hats uh, and I've worked closely with Nini over the past few years to develop uh, different versions of the Daniel's Digital Design Camp, both in kind of in the physical and in the virtual. Um, but in my own work, um, I look at how we talk to machines uh, and how we communicate design ideas to machines and how we materialize these design ideas. Uh, and what you're seeing here is a large scale robotic system uh, that we have the Daniels faculty that allows us to directly communicate um, components and parts from our designs to their like physical manifestation. Uh, and we do this through you know, a variety of formats to deliver um, component-based designs and systems uh, to communicate out um, the, the design possibilities that are inherent within kind of in, inside of digital design models themselves. Uh, so through my own work, I've explored a variety of different means in which we use fabrication technologies uh, that are directly driven by our digital designs to manifest themselves through a variety of different formats and tools. Um, what you're seeing here is actually an acoustic wave wall that helps to actually improve the sound performance within a meeting space um, so this is directly taken from our digital model and then CNC milled to actually create this kind of, you know, very waveform surface you see that then has a really direct influence and on our physical environment. Um, what you're also seeing here is a kind of a variety of prototypes at different scales, looking at kind of depths and materiality, um, then beginning to understand how we manifest from the digital uh, to the physical reality within, you know, our design environment. And I do this at a variety of different scales and techniques with different tools and software, um, working closely with the students in both in the master's and the undergrad program. What you're seeing is an acoustic wall uh, system that's um, similar to how a brick assembly would work. Um, so we you know, stack brick by brick to create this differential wall that has different acoustic characteristics within it that allows us to then kind of, from our digital design, begin to understand how we're actually influencing our physical reality itself. Um, I've also built at a very large scale. This is a two-story pavilion that was built at the Hungerberg in ETH Zurich um, as part of like a master's program I worked in years ago. But then you begin to understand the manifestation of, you know, this kind of complex geometry and how do we actually begin to think about taking this out of the computer into the physical reality uh, with the design systems and machines and understand how we communicate to the machines and really begin to use them to our advantage to work in kind of this co-optive method of uh, building these like complex structures or systems or whatever our imagination starts to put into, you know, the digital design world itself. Um, and here you can see kind of like the components are obviously getting lifted into place and kind of the, the built kind of final form of this system as it becomes to be assembled. Uh, on top of that, outside of my kind of research work, I'm also the digital fabrication coordinator at Daniels, which means I oversee a variety of digital tools, uh, anything from laser cutters that we can then use to cut like paper, uh, cardboard, very thin woods and very thin plastics, 
uh, to begin to you know, take out our geometry from these digital worlds and begin to parse them out to uh, fabrication machines. And alongside that, a variety of different types of 3D printers, um, which allow us to kind of print really complex surfaces and components and pieces that we design within our, our digital world uh, to be able to you know, physically hold on to them and understand what they look like as kind of like a prototype part. Um, along with the you know water jet cutters and also uh, CNC milling machines, which are kind of you know the inverse of a 3D printer in which we remove material to then allow you know the final part of form to be revealed. On top of this, I also teach uh, our undergraduate students in the technology stream, and in, within the technology stream, we really begin to look at how we can harness both like design, simulation, animation to create like really unique and engaging environments and systems uh, for people. So what you're seeing here is a series of uh, sensorial tents that were designed by one of the groups in the ARC 380 technology stream uh, studio last term. They were designed as these kind of like spaces that we can inhabit um, and be, begin to be used for kind of therapeutic purposes and how we can actually you know, create these moments of engagement in spaces um, that you know, are very playful and interactive. And to understand this is obviously like an inflated piece of uh, infrastructure that we can then begin to inhabit. Um, and how do we begin to actually communicate these ideas uh, through kind of diagramming and rendering and modeling uh, and bringing this all together to give a visual package in which we can begin to communicate our design ideas uh, within the digital landscape. Uh, because obviously, uh, due to COVID, last year, all our studios were in the, in the digital world. So all of the design work had to be communicated in kind of this digital format. Here's one of the kind of final tents of this, of this piece. But at the same time, you know, to begin to dream really big and what can actually happen within this space. Uh, within the same studio, a group of students um, also designed a um, interlinking um, deployable space, a low earth space habitat system, um, you know, so to begin to envision what design would actually begin to look like in space and how we could actually begin to occupy it and designing this, you know, this really interesting expandable system that could like uh, aggregate and um, fold into itself and allows this moments of like occupation within these pods. And how does this kind of future living environment begin to look like um, if one could imagine human beings, you know, fully uh, moving into the the realm of space. And here's kind of a final rendering of what this looks like, obviously, you know, floating above the earth, uh, you know, miles away. Um, and then also kind of the, the prototype parts that come out of this and how do we actually begin to physically uh, create these, these components and pieces and what they might actually look like. So what you're seeing here is uh, small 3D printed pieces that some of the students did, obviously on their own printers at home um, due to kind of current COVID restrictions. But then actually directly engaging with some of the problems that we're facing today. And this really will relate to some of the, the key aspects of the design camp and how we're, it's being approached this year. Um, and this was actually a origami facade system that the students developed for the um, student residences to expand the possibilities of the physical outdoor space by creating an origami facade that they tested both kind of um, in physical kind of printing format here and both in folded paper to begin to understand how this could expand outwards and create more space off the living balcony um, and then become like a four season space so that it could close itself off in the winter so you wouldn't allow the elements in, open itself up in the summertime, uh, create much more of an expansive experience and extend the living environment uh, of the current, um, you know, typical size of the, uh, of the dwelling units at the residences here at uh, University of Toronto. And then kind of looking at the spatial engagement of what does it look like with a person inside of there in the kind of the current living domain? What does the system look like when it's closed? What does it look like when it's open? And really beginning to understand how we communicate our ideas through kind of like plan section model to then their physical manifestation as a, uh, as a, as a byproduct coming out of the computer. So the Daniels Digital Design Camp in, uh, began in about 2019. The students at that time really began to look at, uh, you know, drones um, and how they could actually create their own kind of drone, um, drone racetrack. So the students began to develop kind of these series of gates, um, first starting at kind of the model scale as a physical output, then going up to kind of the one-to-one -one scale. So really begin to understand what happens when we design in the computer and what do we 
output at model scale or what do we output at the one-to-one -one scale? Uh, engaging with both CNC milling technologies and laser cutting technologies. Uh, the students engage in a variety of presentations from speakers in areas of fabrication. This is obviously myself, <laughs> which is kind of oddly self-referential. Uh, <laughs> to people within industry that directly engage with the 3D printing world on a, a constant basis, to other people within academia that do research into kind of biomimetics and how uh, plant-based structures and systems get analyzed. So the exposure to the level of speakers and the level of engagement around these kind of fabrication technologies and digital design is very all-inclusive within the camp. To then seeing the kind of the physical artifact of the final output um, from the camp and seeing what this you know, what happens when it comes out of the computer? What does that scale actually look like? And you get this really incredible sense of how you actually engage at scale, how you build, how you begin to kind of work cooperatively uh, with other students on a design problem and project and go through the entire process of, you know, from digital design to fabrication, to assembly, to painting, to, to testing. Um, and here's another one of our speakers who's also a faculty member at the Daniels faculty. And then you can see here the final kind of assemblage of this uh, of this drone um, drone racetrack landscape in our in our principal hall, in which uh, all the parents were invited to come and watch as the students uh, you know program these uh, these drones to fly the racetrack uh, autonomous autonomously or in manual control. So students really begin to understand like spatial constructs coming out of the computer to their physical manifestation in the real world. And then also, you know, having a little bit of fun with some LEDs and, and lighting it up and everyone got to kind of custom paint and create a, like a degree of decoration and design across the surfaces after they'd uh, all been CNC milled and assembled. And then last year, as we tr obviously transitioned in towards a digital format, uh, we partnered with the Kensington BIA on a series of sites and projects to reinvigorate and begin to understand uh, how do you meet the needs of a client uh, within design and architecture? Um, so working closely with the Kensington BIA, a series of sites were selected as moments of engagement within the community or moments that needed to be uh, fixed or remedied within the, within the Kensington area. Uh, so looking at how do we create these new, new planters, um, how do they re start to re-engage the community? So what you're seeing here is a SketchUp model that's been dropped back in uh, with Photoshop. So students get this really incredible direct engagement between understanding how do we do some kind of like post-production to place our digital model into a found image to begin to understand the way it looks within the space. Um, they engage directly with uh, softwares, including SketchUp and some of the Adobe suites, um, including like Photoshop and Illustrator uh, to begin to understand how do you take models from one environment into another to begin to like render them and place them. Uh, so you can see here, you know, this, digital model that came out of SketchUp uh, being placed into one of the parkettes that is inside of the inside of the Kensington area. That was one of these moments where we were looking to how do you reinvigorate this area within the community and create these moments of activation to, to bring people back in, um, you know, to, to make it much more of an active space and less neglected than it has been in previous years. Um, and then you can see it even looking, zooming back out within the same parkette, we begin to see, you know, how do these planters work and become these bicycle holders, um, how can a design object be twofold and serve multiple purposes instead of one singular purpose? Um, so students get this really kind of incredible direct engagement with the production. Um, this is a still from one of the design camps um, that we do in the undergraduate level with uh, Jay Pooley, who's a uh, professor of the Daniels faculty as well. And this is one of the pavilions they built one summer for the Lulu, for Lululemon as a, as a design client. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, how do we engage with the community um, from some of our faculty members work here. Uh, this is, uh, I believe this is Victor's uh, installation at, um, at Cherry, Be Cherry Beach, I believe. And then kind of looking at, the, you know, the, the parks um, and how do we, you know, utilize these as moments of engagement, kind of like how do we look at these um, examples uh, to to kind of inspire and allow the students to like kind of explore the creativity within these types of spaces and what do we begin to actually look at. Um, so the one week summer camp always really kind of last year began with um, design examples or moments that really excited the students or these moments of engagement that they thought they could look towards. 
um, and planted these incredible idea boards in Miro that became really the starting point of a, a collaborative process. Um, and how does everyone come together within the digital to begin to explore their own design ideas within you know, site and context? And then also thinking about, obviously within that, starting to understand the notion of scale and how does scale work in the digital? Um, how does scale work in something that's not really relative to a lot of people? So you can see here, obviously this, this like figure of a lamp could be the size of a large sheltering system. And then you get the notion of the scale with a human figure next to it within uh, the software SketchUp. And then the students go through an entire process of like, you know, what worked, what didn't, uh, what ideas, um, you know, is everyone kind of collaborating on? Uh, what questions are, do we still have about the design work? So there's this really incredible collaborative design process that begins to occur after kind of the initial starting out of just, you know, putting all the ideas on the board um, and what are the possibilities within that space? Um, you know, and which directions do we want to begin to take? Um, so for this year's uh, design project, we're getting to directly look at the University of Toronto campus um, and actually the University of Toronto campus and kind of obviously in the, in the time of COVID and how do we create outdoor engaging learning environments? Um, you know, how do we take the learning environment to the exterior and what are the possibilities that are, you know, within that? Um, obviously the University of Toronto campus is quite vast. We have, a, you know, a lot, of, a lot of green spaces around many buildings and these offer these really perfect opportunities for these moments of engagement. So through the design cap this summer, we'll be looking at a series of sites in, around the, in and around and on the Toronto, University of Toronto campus as these moments of activation. And what can these moments of activation really begin to look like? Um, and what does it look like when we begin to try to bring the interior programming to the exterior and what types actually are they? And here you can obviously see some of these moments of the Everyone's probably familiar with these now, these kind of COVID circles of how we you know, you distribute people across and within a park. Um, and thinking about kind of these constraints that we have to operate within now. Um, and constraints don't always have to be a hindrance. They can also be an incredible design driver at the exact same time. Um, no one would have ever thought that this could be such a really interesting pattern making system within an open field until the time of COVID actually arose. And we design, adjust and adapt and think of new ways or creative ways of engaging our spaces. I, uh, I realize our, our leader actually couldn't join us today, but I'd just like to take a moment to introduce who will actually be um, one of the leaders uh, for the students this summer. His name is Hamid uh, Nadi. He's a Master of Landscape student at the University of Toronto, and he's in his final year. Uh, his thesis highlights the lack of open space in Toronto's urban core while finding empty spaces that have the potential to be transferred into functioning open spaces. He's very passionate about how cities are shifted and changing in the near term future and COVID has and how COVID has exacerbated the way our cities are going to be utilized. He believes design and architectural invent interventions uh, can increase the quality of life, making cities a more enjoyable uh, space to live within. And I think if we think about, you know, in this, uh, in this time of, of COVID and this kind of how we're going to design to occupy these kind of spaces, and what are these moments within the city that we can begin to kind of like look at and analyze um, as moments of engagement that once would have been overlooked. Uh, so this is a, a temporary parkette uh, that was, you know, constructed along, I believe this old King Street, another one of the parkette competition pieces. Um, and, you know, we're now activating the, what was once like a traffic lane space uh, with a kind of a design iterative idea, uh, very similar to the Kensington BIA work from last year, where we looked at these moments and how can they be reinvigorated and, you know, reappropriated for another purpose uh, through a design lens and context. Uh, this is the Elm Street Parkette, which is a, a project in Elm Street that creates this, you know, obviously another outdoor kind of like living space and environment, um, a moment of engagement. Uh, that we start to reclaim the street um, for pedestrian use and expand the pedestrian corridor within the urban context. This is a, another project from Jay Pooley, uh, another uh, one of the little lemon meditation kind of design builds for the students collaboratively come together, think through a design process and problem um, to come to kind of a final digital design model to then be you know, fabricated and prototyped. Uh, this is the pipe pavilion which is, you know, if you just think of a simple sauna tube and how this can actually be aggregated and just 
distributed to create these really incredible forms and surfaces that offer moments of shelter and sitting and relaxation, uh, just creating these really interesting moments of engagement, you know, obviously within the city. But then if you think back to the University of Toronto and how can we start to create moments of programming that extend what we always have viewed as kind of interior systems, um, thinking of like the library and how can we actually make that as a pop-up that get, gets pulled out and constructed in one of the fields and how does that, you know, then close down at night uh, to open up during the daytime? Uh, how does it create these moments of engagement um, where, you know, even if you come by, you could see and look in and understand uh, that there's a programmatic aspect to this, that it isn't just some shelter or shed that, oh, this is actually a library, um, you know, and if we come back during the daytime, it'll be open um, and people can like check out books or, you know, engage within the park space around it. So that our program is really designed uh, for participants aged uh, 14, uh, 12 to 14. So grades uh, seven to eight, but is also very amenable to, you know, ages one year less or uh, higher than that. Um, as long as they are comfortable working with students that might be a little bit younger, a little bit older. Um, and it's really for people or students that are really interested in design, technology, science, and engineering. Uh, architecture as a field is incredibly all-encompassing where we begin to look at material, system, um, design language, the ability to communicate an idea, um, the ability to like speak and present the work uh, publicly. So all of this will be foregrounded with lectures from participating architects and people within the field and from the faculty. Uh, we'll be conducting virtual uh, field trips in and around the University of uh, Toronto campus. Uh, also with one-on-one -on -one instruction and feedback for how their uh, work is progressing and what to potentially look at and how to actually kind of invigorate the site, um, you know, the notion of scale and kind of principles within design and how they can actually be applied. Um, there will also be an interim uh, final review with the University of Toronto staff and faculty. Uh, so their students will allow to be directly presenting their ideas to people within the faculty and from architecture. Uh, the program was obviously uh, similar to last year, going to take place over Zoom. Um, and we will, the students will be set up with a Adobe software and uh, SketchUp as kind of the main design driver interface to begin to look at uh, how we can actually begin to engage these moments within the city. And the offerings will be within uh, two half day um, for two weeks in the half day format and one week in a full day format. So these are actually just some really incredible examples of like taking the notion of the library as a system and extending it to the exterior, right? And how can this become an exterior space that we begin to like think about and occupy? Thanks, Nicholas. That was really great. So, um, so for our families, uh, I just wanted to kind of expand on what Nicholas has said. So, um, the all of the information, a link has been shared in the chat with the information around um, the details. So, if you're interested in fees, um, uh, it's on the website. Um, we heard from families that they were interested in both uh, having the option of a two week half day or a one week full day program. And so we are offering both. So you can check the different offerings on the website um, as well. The, the main requirements for this program is to have a computer with Wi-Fi access. The software we will provide uh, as needed. And then we'll also look at some free software as well. A lot of the software, the, the, um, the information they receive about, for instance, the Adobe suite, the way that you use those programs are kind of universal. And so there are many free programs that students can also uh, engage with. Um, uh, as well, you can, uh, most of these softwares also allow for a trial if your participant wanted to test it out in advance. So there are trial versions, but they will have access to the Creative Cloud during the actual program. You know, I think uh, the power of the program and why I really love collaborating with uh, Nicholas is that Nicholas, as a, um, an expert in fabrication, really understands how not only how to design, but to actually see and assist people in seeing their design come to life. Obviously this year we cannot physically build things, but we're going to design with the physical build in mind. So we wanna help students think about how would this actually be built? What are the materials that you might use? How might you assemble it? You know, and uh, um, some of the work that Nicholas showed of course is at an undergraduate level, but I can say uh, for the participants from last summer, it is amazing just how in a week they're able to really understand how to 
deal with the problem. So like take a creative problem, come up with a solution and then communicate it through um, a, a visual means and through verbal means to someone else. And so that we see is like a really amazing skill that's transferable no matter where a student goes in the future. Just having that capacity of being able to actually show someone your idea is something that's really empowering. And so I think that is the, the main um uh, the main emphasis of the program is to, is that skill set of you know thinking through the design. How do you how do you you know iterate a design solution? But then how do you communicate that? And how can you make the other person really understand what you're what you're trying to show? And we can use uh, like we said tools like SketchUp to model those things, and then tools like Photoshop to mimic how it might look in the real world. So um, and you know having that that critical feedback from members and having to change your design in reaction to that uh, feedback is really a, such a useful tool and something that I think young people are learning really early on is how to incorporate feedback, not to take it personally, but to take the feedback as constructive criticism or um, you know new, new needs that might need to be met in the project uh, itself. So sometimes when we met with Kensington Market, they would say, oh, we this is something else that we have to consider when we're working on this site. And so we would then, the students would then take that information and look at their actual proposal and see if it needed to be adjusted. So having that experience is really, I think, such a powerful thing to go through. So we certainly um, uh, are open to the questions. So we have a question from Tanya. Um, is it is a Chromebook suitable for the program? Um, I think that a Chromebook would like unlikely be enough uh, to actually support um, the actual software for Adobe, but we can actually uh, double check that. Um, I think the Adobe Creative Cloud usually requires either a PC or uh, a Mac as opposed to a Chromebook OS, but we can confirm that and we'll put that information on the website. Uh, unless Nicholas, you know that by. I don't know off the top of my head, but it would be if, if, a, if there's a web-based version of any of the software, then it would be suitable, but we'll just have to double check on that. Yeah, I think that it, it's possible to use the web-based version, but usually there's limitations then on the, the, the tools that you can use. So for like the best experience, it's usually better to have a full, uh, like a laptop that's either PC or Mac, but um, we'll, we can confirm that and put that in, uh, in one of the FAQs on the, um, on the website. Uh, so if there are other questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. Um, I also want to uh, let you know that there is another program that we're going to be uh, hosting an open virtual open house for tomorrow, which is around the Daniel's Minecraft camp. So it's using the um, the game Minecraft as a way of learning about architecture, which is also really amazing and incredible. So that's tomorrow um, at noon again on Zoom. So there's a registration on the, the Daniel's website if you're interested in that. Um, is there anything else, Nicholas, that you think is really important for families to know? I just think it's like, it's really, I think last year it was really incredible to see the collaborative aspect of the work that started to come together digitally with the students. And they really began to understand how to like work even within like a site and design constraints in the virtual world. And it really like, I think informed them to the power that exists, even if you can't get to a site of what, uh, what design actually holds. And then working with Kensington BIA, I think it was an incredible experience for them to see what it's like to have a client. Mm -hmm. You know, have the client give you a few goals that are really entirely necessary for the, the project and then to, to work towards those goals with the client. I think it was like such a nice, incredible experience for the students. Yeah, and at this year, our client will be U of T. So we'll be pulling staff from across the university to actually provide that feedback. Um, they'll also learn a bit about the history of, of how, so universities are really interesting generators of uh, city building. So they're a very specific part of the city. Uh, and so understanding how cities are made is also part of this. So understanding how the university came to be, how, how a building happens on campus, some of these things will be explained um, in, uh, in the process of looking at these sites because you really need to understand the history of a site. So last year we learned about Kensington and how the, the history of Kensington is a, kind of a history of Toronto in a lot of ways, you know? Yeah. 
So I think that was super helpful. For those in the local area, we will provide those sites in advance if you wanted to go and check out the sites with, um, you know, make that a field trip for yourselves. There is no need to actually be in the local area for this year. We will provide those virtual uh, tours of those sites as well. So there'll be video tours, pictures, those kinds of resources for those who cannot actually um, be close by. Um, and so, uh, Either way, you'll be able to really understand the site from the material that we provide. But, it, you know, I think a lot of students that were in the local area for last year actually went to visit Kensington just to check out exactly what that uh, community was like. And so, um, you know, we'll be sharing kind of um, a lot of information about the university, city building, how, how projects happen. And, you know, I think that, again, this um, idea of how, how these um, types of small interventions have huge impact and are, are things that are actually buildable, like things that you can actually make. And, uh, you know, someone like Nicholas actually makes these kinds of projects or helps people make these kinds of projects on a quite a regular basis. So um, we just, uh, you know, Nicholas will introduce, uh, um, the, the students to all of the different types of fabrication that we have at our school. So um, I think that's a really interesting thing as well to see. Uh, I think you showed this the, Nicholas in your presentation, but like all the different types of tools from 3D printing to laser cutting, all of those kinds of um, materials are really an uh, interesting way to not only fabricate, but to test your idea. So you don't have to build the whole thing all at once. You might build a mini prototype and then you might build a small, a small section that you're trying to work out. So how that happens. So I think that's everything for us today. We really hope you enjoyed. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. We really hope you enjoyed this explanation of what our camp is. Um, and we, again, invite you to tomorrow's session at noon. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you this summer. We're really excited. And um, Hamed was uh, as a student, so he was unable to join us today, but he's very excited in, in teaching. So we look forward to all of you. And if you have questions, you can email me. My email is in the, in the website. And it's also my cell phone number is there if you need to call and, and chat. So thanks, everybody. And we hope to see you this summer.